Well, hi there. It's Jonathan Faust. I am happy to have this time with you. Thank you so much for tuning in to this webcast. Uh, we've got a special one uh, here. Um, I'm going to offer a short little meditation and then an introduction to an interview with Dr. John Britton on whole brain healing. It's an amazing story of a brain injury he had and his recovery um, and what what left brain, right brain means and uh, how you might take some of the, his experience and apply it to your own practice. So lots of really, really good stuff ahead. So before we dive into our meditation, uh, some thank yous to our producers, Glenn Harrison and Leo Gimo. Thank you, thank you. To the Insight Meditation Community of Washington for hosting this. To my good friends at the Unitarian Universalist Church of Arlington, thank you. And to our mindful movement leader and mindful dialogue leaders. The whole Monday night experience, 630 Eastern Standard, you can join Rita Moran for mindful movement. Wonderful way to prepare for meditation and a talk. Afterward, around 835 or so, you can join Mindful Dialogue with Ray Manioki and Tara Cassidy. Thank you, guys. Great way to connect with other people, talk about the talk, about your practice, about applying mindfulness in your life in general. It's a really wonderful way to get quality connection with people not unlike you. So, um, again, thank you for your support. This is all offered freely. And there is, as you can imagine, considerable expense that goes into rolling this out. Um, and your support really, really, really makes a difference, not only in getting this out, but of course, in my lavish lifestyle. All right, let's get to it. And um, when you're ready, you might want to stretch, maybe reach your arms up overhead, maybe open your jaw, move it from side to side. Let out any sounds. Ah, oh, man. You get to meditate. How awesome is this? There's something so powerful. I've been mentioning this a lot recently, but I find it for myself that when you close your eyes, you immediately begin to change your state. So if you like noticing the space around you, close your eyes and feel this automatic shift from the outer world to this heightened awareness of the inner world. And for a few moments, let yourself just soften, relax, feel. What's the quality of your, of your physical state right now? Is your body energized, restless? Is it relaxed? Is it open? Are there any places inside that feel particularly tense or unpleasant? In any areas that may feel nice, pleasant? What's the quality of the mind? Is the mind racing? Is the mind settled? Quality of mood is your heart of shut down and self-preservation, or does it feel more kind of open and relaxed? Whatever you're noticing, just notice it. Mindfulness holds nothing for or against what's happening. Mindfulness is this unblinking eye. It just notices what is. And you might, in your own time, begin to slow down and deepen your breath. Notice what happens if you breathe slow and deep, and in particular, if you smooth out the breath, no rough edges in your breathing. And allow yourself to begin to sense what it's like to soften softening from the inside, the muscles of your face. Softening, relaxing the inside of your mouth, and letting your tongue begin to relax and fill your lower jaw. Could you 
relax your jaw and at the same time, relax the root of your tongue. Feel your forehead smooth. Softening the muscles around the eyes. Imagine now that you could feel the full weight and volume and heaviness of your arms. You might imagine your arms like heavy drapes hanging from your shoulders. Over the next three breaths, feel from the inside the volume of your arms, the weight. Could you soften your palms? And as you soften and relax the palms, how intimately can you feel any sense of pulse or tingling through the palms and fingers and thumbs? Could you soften through your lower back and through the buttocks? And can you sense from deep in the belly the subtlety of the breath? And here you might take three slow breaths and notice how intimately you can feel the subtlest of sensations deep in the abdomen. Feel the floor of the pelvis and the hip joints. And sense, if you can, from the inside out, from the hips to the knees. The knees down through the ankles. And the tops of the feet and the toes. the soles of the feet and the heels. And can you sense now the breath effortless and free flowing and sensing anything inside that might soften or relax? Let your attention move to either the breath, noticing where you feel the breath the most predominant right now, or to the awareness of the sound vibrations as they're happening. Or perhaps the feeling in the palms and fingers and thumbs, the sense of pulse or tingling. And for these next few minutes, selecting one of these anchors, breath, sound, or the feeling in the palms, let this be your primary focus. When you notice the mind naturally wandering without judgment, maybe even with a bit of compassion, 
Escort your attention back, back to the here and now. Notice this quality of the witness or the observer. Notice what's changing. Both your anchor and a sense of the background. And you might sense again this quality of, of preferenceless awareness. Noticing what's changing and sensing what it means to truly let things be as they are. For the next minute now, imagine you could release any sense of doing, any sense of control or manipulation. And open more intimately into a sense of allowing and being. Exploring this question, in the absence of effort, what do you notice? What do you feel inside? You might now begin to deepen your breath. Let the body sway a little bit from side to side. Let out any sounds. If you like, you can, in your own time, open your eyes. No rush, no hurry. I'm honored to share the following conversation with you. This is a conversation with Dr. John Britton. Chances are, being the pioneer that you are, you've heard about uh, Dr. Jill Bolte Taylor's God experience when her, her left brain was damaged. Dr. John Britton had a similar but very different experience when he experienced a profound right brain injury. And what's very interesting is there's not a lot of research on right brain injury. So John has had to kind of forge his own path. And he has deeply, deep, the, he's got a PhD, an unofficial PhD in, in, in his research. There's so much to learn about left brain, right brain, and what happens when the right brain is in control of your life. Not a lot of fun. But John has an amazing story of how he has found his own healing, and it's been such a privilege for me to be um, to be a part of John's life in this journey. So I think you're going to find the following interview um, really fascinating and helpful for your own practice. So thank you, thank you so much for your time, John, and thank you for your time to be here. Enjoy the following conversation with Dr. John Britton on whole brain healing.
Welcome. I am really um, excited and pleased to uh, share this interview with you with Dr. John Britton, um, an accomplished anesthesiologist. It's hard to say anesthesiologist without sounding it, like you're drunk, I have to say. <laughs> Uh, but John, at the very top of his professional game, experienced something very profound that created a real a tremendous health crisis that affected the right side of his brain. And he went through quite a period of loss, and not only having to step back from his practice, losing his driver's license, having to dedicate his life full time to his recovery. Um, I'm truly honored to know John and to have had time with him. And his exploration has opened up this fascinating exploration about the functioning of the brain. You may know some about left brain, right brain functioning. John's currently writing about his experiences, about his recovery, and about the practices that have helped him to recover. And I feel that for someone who is interested in becoming more whole, more awake, uh, more enlightened, if you will. Uh, his story and his insights are truly compelling. So, John, thank you so much for taking the time to be here. Uh, well, Jonathan, I'm, I'm so glad to be here. It's great. So, um, I always find it interesting to, to think in terms of the sort of like the call to action, if you will, like, you know, the, the, the hero's journey, you know, something happens and then we have to respond to the call. And I wonder if you could just share with us some of the backstory about what happened that turned your life upside down and had you reorient your life. Yeah. Um, I will admit it's kind of an interesting story, but, um, when I was a resident in anesthesiology, um, I got a little, um, herpetic infection in my finger. Um, back when I was a resident, we didn't use gloves. It wasn't considered necessary um, and no protective eyewear. Um, and I put a breathing tube in a, a young boy that had been badly burned and um, he'd had no signs that he had a, um, a cold sores on his, on his lips, but he probably had harbored uh, the herpes virus, which is the uh, herpes simplex type one, there's two types of herpes virus, one that's around your face and one that's around your genital area. But anyway, um, the, the infection traveled up my arm um, and I had severe pain in my arm for a few days and it went away with um, antiviral treatment. And then 30 years later, it came back. And what I found... I've learned so much about basically her herpes viruses and uh, neurology, but it basically lives at the base of your brain in this nerve called the the fifth cranial nerve, which is the nerve that provides uh, sensation to your face um, and to your brain, actually. And then 30 years later, it came back and it affected my brain. Um, so for 30 years, it basically resided there dormant, if you will. Mm -hmm. Any sense of what was sort of triggered um, the event? No. Um, you know, people talk about some sort of stress that causes the virus to come out, but I can't say as I had any <laughs> any outstanding stress. You know, I was just uh, working really hard, you know, taking call. Um, I can't think of anything in particular, but... Um, yeah, what what happened was I I fainted in the doctor's lounge while I was having breakfast, and uh, um, I was completely passed out. I woke up and went to the emergency room. And <clears throat> I was perfectly lucid. They did, and they couldn't find anything to hang their hat on, so I was discharged. Um, wow! So you left, you were discharged. You left, and you just assumed that was kind of a an anomaly of some kind. Yeah, you know, I felt a little tired, but not, <laughs> I didn't really think about it very much. You know, I think sometimes you deny things because, uh, you know, when you're you're working hard and you're going through the education process, you just sort of ignore a lot of feelings. 
um, which maybe we can come back to. But anyway, um, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I didn't think much of it. So, um, and then the following day, I was I was supposed to go see my mom in, uh, in Vermont, who has had a bunch of doctor's appointments. She uh, was suffering from cancer, and I was going to visit the oncologist. So, um, I went to uh, went up to see her in Vermont. You know, flew up and had a rental car, and then I started feeling very drowsy, uh, like really drowsy, and I couldn't figure out why. So I I stopped <laughs> I stopped my rental car in front of a little strip mall in a small town in New Hampshire. And um, the there was a police officer that pulled up next to me, and he uh, had me roll down my window. And I, he said, "You know, I've been getting reports that you've been driving erratically. I need to have you uh, come with me." So, uh, you know, I came, and I had a breathalyzer test, which was negative. And so then he called a uh, narcotics officer who is a district narcotics officer who said, I, I know you're on drugs. Uh, I said, no, I'm an anesthesiologist. I know what drugs are. <laughs> I'm not on any sort of drugs. And um, they said, well, we're going to take you to a hospital and get your, uh, your uh, blood drawn. So they took me to this hospital. It was getting kind of dark. Um, and it was negative. Everything was negative. So they they took you to the hospital to draw your blood to basically uh, prove that you were on some form of narcotics or something. That's right, and uh, my the test was completely negative. <laughs> so what was but your I, experience like there? I mean, suddenly here you are, this upstanding guy who's being accused of uh, being on narcotics, and um, yeah. what was that like? That's an interesting question because there's so much denial and burying of feelings, you know, like uh, I think normally people would be very angry or scared. I wasn't, I wasn't either one. I just sort of, well, wow, this is very interesting. I'm going to have to go through this process and hopefully things will turn out all right so I can get, get to Vermont. Mm -hmm. um, and there was a hooker, the cop, <clears throat> Cops said, well, I'm going to confiscate your rental car um, and give me the keys. So I gave him the keys and he took me to a bus depot in the middle of nowhere. It was really dark. I had to figure out the bus that was going up to uh, Vermont. And so um, he also reached in my wallet and took $20 for bail. I do remember that part. Um which I didn't think much of it, but I just said, I've never experienced anything like this. This is very interesting. Mm. So I got on a bus and went to Vermont. It was really dark. Got to um, the bus terminal, which was in a parking lot near the Veterans Administration Hospital in, Vermont, in White River Junction, Vermont. And I looked on the board to see if there was a taxi that could take me to this little town in Vermont where my mom lived. And I didn't have any cash, so I had to look for a taxi that took a credit card. <laughs> anyway, um, I think the last coherent thing I did before things started going way downhill was directing this taxi driver in his Jeep to uh, Barter, Vermont, a little town of maybe a couple, couple thousand people. Um, so it was quite a quite a dark time mm. that I didn't I just sort of said, well, like a lot of things I've done in life, you just sort of get through it and don't mm. think about it too much. So you were pretty much just in survival mode, one foot in front of the other. And I would imagine you were starting to, you know, feeling more um more shifts internally in terms of your cognition and all that sort of thing. Um, yes, you know, I felt incredibly tired and I couldn't figure out why, because I hadn't really had sleep deprivation or, mm. um, you know, just a general fuzzy feeling. Like I, 
my thinking processes were a little dull, but, you know, again, I couldn't figure out, there wasn't any reason. So I just sort of let it, let it go. Wow. So you made it to your mother's house. Yeah. Um, you know, in the following day, I, um, I took her to, uh, her appointments. Uh, we got a, since I didn't have a car, <laughs> we had to ask a friend to uh, take us to the the medical center, which was about an hour drive away. Um, got there and I just continued to feel really sleepy and got through the oncology appointment, came back to my mom's place, had dinner. And then in the evening time, um, I started kind of doing weird things like I walked into my mom's bedroom and looking for my clothes in her closet and uh, said that I needed to get clothes for work <laughs> and she said you're you're not a, you're what's going on you're not a, you don't need work clothes and uh, then I got some ice cream out of her freezer and I put it in the oven to to warm it up because it was really solid <laughs> and then just started wandering around. So she called her best friend, who was a retired English professor at UVM, University of Vermont. And uh, Margaret came over and started taking notes like a good English professor. And she called her husband and she's, you know, she said, David, John's acting this way. And he said, well, something's wrong. Call 911. So she did. And Went to this little hospital, uh, you know, about 15 miles away from where I, my mom lived and got, and then fell essentially into a coma uh, with intermittent periods of lucency. So, uh, so at that time, as you were starting to act pretty strange outwardly, just from the, the medical point of view, what was happening in your brain? during that period? Um, what was happening is the herpes virus was invading my, uh, my uh, basically my brain cells. So um, my ability to think, in other words, uh, 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 impulses weren't traveling to the right places so that I could think properly. Wow. And uh, my consciousness was greatly impaired. Um, and um, it um, is very aggressive about going after uh, certain areas of your brain. But anyway, you know, it created this incredible inflammation. And that that's part of the problem. It's like a, a, a five alarm fire um or a, a, basically a two alarm fire and a five alarm fire response so my Im immune system was really working over time to try to kill off this herpes virus but the herpes virus is very cagey and um can get around the uh the human immune response so basically i i had my brain was on fire both from an infection and from my body's response to the wow so you went into a coma yeah wow wow yeah um so i went to this little hospital and um thank god they had this antiviral medicine called acyclovir um that they gave intravenously it was just a miracle they had it because it's very expensive and uh, a lot of times hospitals can't afford to stock it um but i got it you know, and that really saved my life. And uh, so, if you hadn't had gotten it, what what would have happened at that critical time? Well, I don't know exactly how long I could survive, but it would have been probably just a a couple of days, and I would have been dead. Wow! Um, wow! Because, yeah, and the other thing is, it prevents your brain from being entirely annihilated by. <laughs> by the herpes virus, you know, because uh, that was one big problem. Um, I actually got treated late in the game because the herpes virus had been around for probably a couple of days. 
invading my my brain so um yeah <laughs> so so after you receive this you know this intravenous treatment um did I, i'm assuming that either slowed down or halted the process but from what i understand is a lot of damage was done yes um a lot of damage was done and it primarily was to my right brain hardly anything to my left brain and it all kind of makes sense because the the herpes virus travels north so it went from my finger up my arm into my brain um and it was all on the right side because that's where the initial infection was in my my dominant right hand um yeah so there's severe damage to my right brain. Um, so so this sort of like opens up the the whole piece around number one, like assessing the damage, but then number two, um, an assessment of what what its effect was. Um, and then a third, of course, like looking toward recovery. So uh, when you got the assessment, but what was it what was life like? with the right side of your brain somewhat offline? <laughs> That's a good question because um, it kind of gets into the the realm of what, what the left hemisphere does and what the right hemisphere does. So the left hemisphere is where all the bad stuff happens in our experience as humans. It's where anxiety comes from. It's where judgment comes from. Uh, it's where linear thinking comes from. Um, it's where we get our habits of uh, looking back at what we could have done and what, what we need to do in the future. Um, it's the detail part of your brain. And the right brain is where all the good stuff comes from, basically. It's where uh, uh, compassion and empathy and um, uh, creativity um it's where our senses of humor come from. It's where our ability to understand non-language related stuff like metaphors and uh, poetry and music and whatnot. Um, the left brain doesn't like that stuff. It wants basically details. It wants things broken into details. And so um, my right brain uh, was, was in ashes. So, uh, my left brain was kind of in charge. Unfortunately. Wow. So Jill Bolte Taylor, with whom you've had conversations in the past, you know, mm -hmm. quite famously, you know, told the story of you know, one side of her brain going offline, which was the other side. <laughs> yeah. You know, and and with that was her sort of her experience of presence, of intuition, of this God force, if you will, and just sort of like this blissful place of being. You had the opposite experience. I had the opposite experience entirely. And the thing is, I lived in my left brain mostly anyway. <laughs> uh, yeah, so say a little bit about that. I mean, you were well, you're pretty much yeah. a, you were a left brain guy. That was yeah. your your um your life strategy was pretty much based on the left brain. Yes, you know. Uh, first of all, culturally, we we kind of um, look toward, we like left brain thinking in our culture because um, that's the part of our brain that is detail oriented. That's where, you know, our list of things to do get done. Um, and uh, it's where language comes from. So the left brain really likes using language to describe things. Um, it's also where anger comes from. It's where probably racism comes from because things are, um, you know, the left brain doesn't like things that aren't, aren't um, familiar. Um, whereas the right brain um, think, sees things in talk, uh, context, isn't very language oriented. Um, and, uh, it faces reality and you know the right brain is what 
has uh, humans look at reality. The left brain is where uh, delusions reside. And that's where schizophrenia and um, mm. autism and various thought disorders come from because it's the place of delusion. I think we have a lot, a lot of left brain politicians right now. <laughs> anyway, um, when you don't have a, a right brain to modulate that, the, the left brain, you um, you end up basically being terrorized. Mm. So you you went into the sciences, you know, as a as you you know a farm boy who who became an anesthesiologist. Like you, you dedicated yourself to to science and to cultivating that side of your brain. And I just remember one very ironic comment you made when you uh, saw an art class in college. I wonder if you could just share yeah. that. <laughs> Yeah, I remember walking by the studio art department and saying to myself, who would ever do that? You can't make any money at it. Um, and they're just a bunch of hippies that you can't talk to. And, uh, um, and it was just a really arrogant thought. I never said it to anybody except myself. Well, what I find so ironic, and, and we'll get to this in a little bit, is that that art has actually become a, a major part of your life, not only your recovery, but but um, expressing who you are. So, uh, yes. It's, so, um, John, could you say a little bit about it? Because an interesting thing about your experience is we really get, we really, you got to experience, and by proxy, you know, we get to sense like what it's like when, when the left brain is running things. What, what was it like for you as you're just going through the trauma of recognizing what happened and to f sort of feel the, the left brain running your life? What, what was that like? Um, it was, I don't know what metaphor you would use. It's sort of like being, a, being put in a, in a jail cell and being um, kind of taunted all day long. Wow. Um, because um, for, to give you some examples, you know, I'd wake up in the morning and I didn't have anything to do because I wasn't working. All of a sudden, boom, I didn't have any job. Um, and my left brain would just keep taunting and say, you need to get up and do something. But there was nothing to do. You know, don't take a walk because that's a waste of time. Um, you can be doing something, but there was never any solution, really. Like, doing what? Um, you know, the right brain, which wasn't online, would say, normally, well, the reality is you had a really bad brain injury. You can't work. So just kind of be a little gentler on yourself. Mm. Um, but the left brain just wouldn't allow that. Wow. So there was no kindness, no empathy, just sort of this hard driving critic. Um, yeah, uh, absolutely. Wow. Um, wow. Yeah, it's all, you know, when you, when I step back, I used to say to myself, this is one interesting neurologic experiment I'm witnessing, but it's happening to me. Um, you know, especially to learn more about the function of the left and right brain, like, oh, um, I had a an aha moment once, like, uh, you know, it's struggling with art because the right brain is where your ability to see proportions. Um, so when you're, when you're drawing something, you know, you're, um, your hand isn't as big as your chest, <laughs> um, things like that. Um, and I, and color was hard and, you know, I couldn't recognize faces. Like my son was walking down the street once and I couldn't recognize his face. Um, so art was really hard because all the essential things you need to do art were gone. And an example is, uh, there was some German artist who suffered a right brain stroke like a hundred years ago. And he started drawing faces as squares because the left brain said, you know, things aren't curved, they're straight. Mm. Thus the linear left brain. Wow. Yeah. 
Wow. You, don't, you don't need to draw things in a curve. Um, so, so, so what what I find interesting, John, is that you kind of had access to some of the best scientific minds on the planet, you know, mm -hmm. and you were able to get a lot of the science diagnosis and and from what I understand, a, a lot of folks really didn't know what to do to to kind of help you become integrated again. But but one of them was to to do art. Um. Yes, <clears throat> but that's an interesting point because um, as my neurologist at Johns Hopkins said, you know, we don't know much about the right brain. Uh, um, most of the money spent from the National Institute of Health goes towards the left brain because we're right-handed. Most people are right-handed. Um, and we can, it's where language and memory comes from. So you can kind of check off things that are coming back online if you have a left brain injury. Um, you know, your speech is getting better. You know, your memory is getting better. Whereas the right brain, things are a lot more subtle. Like, um, you know, how do you, <laughs> how do you um, check off? Well, you, your sense of humor is back. <laughs> okay. Uh, your ability to understand irony is back. Well, nobody's going to, there's no test for that, really. Right. Um, or you can draw you can draw a face that looks okay instead of a big square. Um, it just isn't part of. Uh, yeah, we have, we have now determined you can take a hint. You know, <laughs> there's, there's yeah, no, yeah. There's no scale for that. So the question is, like, if someone's you know those who are listening and watching now are kind of thinking, well, my gosh, you know, seems incredibly articulate, you know smart, good-looking guy. It seems like everything's okay. Can you say a little bit about the journey? Because because just because I, you know, we, we've known each other for some years and, you know, there was a time where truly you you really couldn't escape from the the relentlessness of the left brain and the anxiety and the needing to double check if you had if you had taken your medications or if you had turned the lights off, like, you know, it was, a, it was a very profound state of disorientation to put it, to put it mildly. Mm -hmm. Can you say a little bit about what, what has been the process of healing? Um, you know, it's, it's interesting because initially people thought like I was in the brain rehabilitation program at the Washington hospital center and, downtown Washington, D.C., and um, because I, I could talk without a problem and I had memory, people in my program would, would say, well, why are you here? What do you expect to get out of this? And so it's very, um, it was very hard because, you know, people would say, oh, you're back to normal. You can talk. You seem to be walking okay. Um, and you remember things, um, but that's the problem with trying to rehabilitate a right brain is that, um, it's very hard to assess those places that, um, are not necessarily, uh, very, very, uh, compartmentalized, I guess is the way I would put it. And, um, it's interesting too, because trying to, do things like art, all the the things I needed as tools in my brain to uh, do art were gone because art comes from your right brain, really. That's where, like I said, your ability to see things in pro proportion and uh, th see things in perspective, like railroad tracks going into the distance, they, they kind of come to a point. Whereas, you know, in the right brain, that's, you can figure that out. In the left brain, it, they just want, the railroad tracks just keep on going. Mm. um and then colors you know trying to get colors right well you know it's a you know why did you use blue when it's green <laughs> uh well, oh really you know um so it's very discouraging i think you, um, you and, shared once how you were you were working really hard on a piece you know to make it accurate and someone commented on what a beautiful abstract piece of 
aren't you? Or were you had just created? I just, uh, I was like an arrow. Um, yeah. Um, you know, so it was very, um, very discouraging at times. So people ask, I've been asked, well, why did you keep going? You know, given all these difficulties, um, in the, the discouraging thing is um, I couldn't get any answers from anybody. Um, you know, uh, even people that write a lot about left and right brain uh, uh, function, there was no, there's no um, way or there was, there was no um, prescription about how to get, how to rehabilitate your right brain. So um, you had to be, you had no other recourse than to perform experiments and see how, how yeah. they, uh, how they turned out for you. Yeah. Yeah. And that's exactly true. Um, so for, for those, for those who are listening, you know, I think there can be this sense of, just as you were saying that while you were presenting as someone, you know, cogent and articulate, people are thinking, well, what's wrong? And at the same time, here's this kind of unrelenting, you know, critic, you know, here you are kind of like cut off from the flow. And and I think for for many of us, you know, we can feel like well, from the outside, everything's fine, but internally there's that ruthless critic and so forth. So part of our relationship has been around meditation and mm -hmm. some of the somatic inquiry and so forth. And I wonder if you might say a little bit about the role that that has had. Um, yeah, I have a lot of thoughts about meditation, but anyway, um, for me, doing conventional meditation, like sitting and focusing on my breath and um, just sitting and sitting, um, for me, it was a recipe for my left brain to go crazy. Because all of a sudden there was space for it to invade. Now, um, so meditation a lot of days was um, just the recipe to go crazy. Mm. What I think really changed for me was doing focusing. Um, you know, uh, to use Jonathan Faust's term, uh, body centered inquiry. Um, you know, doing that uh basically quieted my left brain enough so my right brain had a chance and you know all these visual images came out that were really interesting and appealing and it's also you know um virtually everything i'm saying I, i'm parroting from other places so i have no original thoughts <laughs> no one but, does <laughs> <laughs> um but, you know, they've looked at Tibetan monks and Franciscan nuns using um, a functional scan called a spec scan. And what it, they asked the Tibetan monks to meditate to the point of a, of a deep place. And the, the same with the Franciscan nuns where they were asked to pray to a deep place. Anyway, their left brains became quiet. So um, if you want, you know, we all live in our left brains too much, probably in the world. Um, so you know, I think it would be really practical if people got to the got to a place or a way of meditating where their left brain became quiet for a while. I think that would be mentally healthy. <laughs> and for me, it was it was like, wow, you know, this is <laughs> I'm I'm thinking so differently now after that experience. You know, to, to maybe just to kind of reiterate a little bit, you know, for those uh, those who are listening, that um, body-centered inquiry is really around training your attention on what we call the felt sense, mm -hmm. the, uh, the the feeling tone in the body. And when I think about the most of the sessions that we do, I remember certainly remember like the first one we did, you know, when you were sensing where there was tension inside. You know, you became aware of like a, of a tension behind your eyes, mm -hmm. you know, kind of a pulling behind the eyes. And 
part of the entryway was you sort of described what it felt like in such detail that I could recreate the same sensations and mm -hmm. and explored how to be with it and then and then something shifted you know the, the the tension began to open and then that seemed to open a portal to to what we call flow just the stream and cascade of images and and you know really amazing uh, amazing experiences with kind of visual displays and kaleidoscope images and so forth yes. that seem to um, create a really interesting space inside. Yes. You know, initially I thought to myself, well, is this going to be freaky? <laughs> and then I then there's this kind of all this ra rationalization going on, you know, no, it's not going to be freaky, you know, you know, you're with Jonathan, he's not going to do something weird or anything like that. Um, and, you know, you don't have any alternative. You do not have any alternative, you got to try this. So, um, you know, that kind of, <laughs> I mean, it was like, uh, I don't know, uh, going down a path where, you know, this was the only way mm -hmm. um, for for now, at least. And um, there, I just sort of sat back and said to myself, well, let's see what happens. And uh, what happened was really, really um, therapeutic. You know, it's interesting because when we think of the, the left brain is always, you know, it's always commenting. It always has that negative bias. And because you were focusing on, you discovered unpleasant sensations kind of behind the eyes, mm -hmm. somehow there's kind of an override. Like we're, let's going to take our attention and we're going to stay with, stay with the unpleasant. It almost seems like it was the willingness to, to turn toward the unpleasant that opened this doorway uh, to a, kind of another another realm where suddenly you're you've shifted from kind of that judging controlling space inside to um, to almost this sense of like free association and ease. Yes, um, you know when I sit back and look at it, I I know there's a part of your left brain that can actually be uh, rational as opposed to irrational. Um, and I think there was a point where there was no alternative. And, um, you know, it's, um, I think it's kind of like having a pilot light on in your uh, hot water heater. You know, it's this little dim light that will, allow you to reignite your your uh, hot water heater um i think you know when you're in a situation of uh not having a lot of hope that this particular thing of doing uh focusing really kind of brought out the the pilot light and ignited something in my in the water heater <laughs> wow it's wow. a, a great it really <laughs> kind of out there metaphor but you know but, um, yeah. but i wonder too john and, and i and i just i find it so interesting because you, like your experience was so extreme and yet we all experience that left brain split you know with one side dominating but i'm also wondering how much that pilot light is this this sense of of the witness you know that just like you know there's the difference between being angry and being with your anger you know, that when you were, when the left brain was so dominant, there was something about the meditative experience that actually allowed you to be aware of, of that function that, that opened up some new possibilities, perhaps. Does that resonate? It does. Um, it does. I think when you're in survival mode, I think you have to have realistic optimism. Like there has to be some hope, um, but it may not be easy. That That's the realism. Well, that, as a doctor for other people, I would imagine that you held that stance for others. Like, yes, 
this is a, you know, yes, this is a problem. And, and the decision tree opens up, you know, three things we might explore that might open up new possibilities and, um, Mm -hmm. be able to do that for yourself it seems uh yeah uh, well <laughs> yes uh so self-compassion is in a really uh in the left brain where we psychologically live at least most of us do i think uh there's not a lot of self-compassion you know like oh you want a new car well this is what you got to do how much overtime you got to do mm -hmm. uh well, you know, if you want to pass this exam, this is the the stuff you got to do. Um, you know, you don't. Um, and the left brain is always in a hurry. You know, um, Carrie Newcomer, who's a, a, a kind of a spiritual Americana a folk singer, um, has this song called "Learn to Sit Without Knowing." The left brain cannot sit without knowing. Wow. You know, how many people in the, you know, growing up or where we live have this problem with not knowing? Mm. I had to, um, that's one thing I learned is that, you know, I don't know. Um, I think that's a thing that people don't say enough of is I, I don't know. Wow. Um, you know, I, I still have the herpes virus in my uh, cranial nerve, and I'll live there forever. Um, there's supposedly a one in a thousand chance it'll come back. And it did once <laughs> a couple of years ago. But, um, you know, that's sort of something I've accepted um, that I don't know. Um, and I think that's a, a very freeing thing to not know. And you accept that. Well, that's one of the elements that it so inspires me about your journey, John, is, you know, moving from the, you know, being, being in a jail cell, you know, with, with the, with the ruthless, the ruthless critic and your perseverance, you know, to, to stay open, to keep trying new things, to, um, it has taken you into a profound a profound journey of of uh, of wholeness and insight and mm -hmm. boy to learn to sit without knowing that's what all the great traditions point to like that's the like that is sort of the top of the mountain in many ways um well it's like i said it's very freeing you know we spend so much mental energy like i need to know um you know, I need to know the outcome of something. And uh, a lot of times there's no answer. No so answer. on your, if you go back in time to, you know, being on your way somewhere and seeing that art class and having having those thoughts, <laughs> and when you take that moment and you sort of like bring it into here and now and where you are in your life right now, um, quite a journey. It is quite a journey. I will admit that. It's quite a story. Like I, you know, in the podcast I did with Jill Bolte Taylor, I said, you know, um, it, it wasn't recorded. I said, this is talking about this, I think is something that'd be useful for the world as a whole, because so many of us live psychologically in our left brain. And, uh, you know, when our minds are, are, are racing, it's all left brain. Um, and if you get into the right brain, it's and you know modulate the left brain, uh, you get you get much more balanced. And I think it's mentally, in terms of mental health, it's just so much better. And that's the key thing I think. If I wanted to tell the world something, you know, <clears throat> there's some simple things you can do that will make you mentally healthier. Mm. And and maybe just in these final final minutes, uh, I, that's a beautiful message. Um, when you say the simple things that help you feel better, can you just say a little bit about what they are for you? Um, I think taking walks in nature. Mm. Um, you know, and what I'm saying is kind of, 
I'm, I'm not saying anything that this is a John Britton <laughs> totally new way of surviving the pandemic or anything else in life because there's so everybody's got an angle but you know this is just my experience i am not prescribing it for anybody but you know i think listening to music um you know there's an australian um uh rock singer named nick cave who talks about how music is where your soul's at mm. because it's where um you know, you're not, you're not using words, although he writes songs with lyrics. <laughs> um, it's not, it's a place of uh, kind of solitude that, you know, music gets you to. I think art, um, even doodling on a sc scrap of paper or just appreciating art, it's just really, again, this is what has, has been useful for me. And I think, um, create you know meditating in a way that you're where your your left brain isn't hijacking you mm. um and that may take <laughs> it may take a while i you know and it's everybody's up got their own way of uh dealing with that but um and i also think being being around people you know um, parker palmer talks about when he was in the throes of a deep depression, that community and solitude, you need both to, mm. to try to handle some badness, some darkness. Wow. wow, thank you for that. You know, I you know, it's one thing to be prescriptive, you know, part of me wants to say, Oh, <laughs> here's Dr. Britton's prescription <laughs> for uh for whole health yeah. living. But I really I just want to kind of reflect back. You know, and I really, I really get that it comes from your experience that that being in nature, you know, is just a profound way of accessing that part of your brain and and mm -hmm. um, listening to music, like taking time to really listen and kind of receive music in the moment, mm -hmm. um, ex exploring art, being around like-minded people, looking for the practices that that sort of help to kind of subdue you know, the left brain, which I imagine are like really being aware of sensation, perhaps even kind of the meta or the kindness practices are all the, yeah. some of the techniques that can help you to, uh, to find that place of balance. Yeah, no, that for sure. Absolutely. Wow. Well, John, thank you so much for your time. Um, what an amazing cool. journey. And I'm so glad you're writing about this, um, uh, because there's, uh, so much we all need to learn about finding balance in these in these weird weird times we live in yeah for sure thank you so much jonathan oh thank you